Welcome, everyone. Good evening. I'm Diana Svitan, and I'm director of the Office of Global Learning and now the Office of International Education. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to our event. And for those of you who are new to FDU, I'd like to welcome you to the College of uh, at Florham campus. So thank you. Um, tonight, we are very fortunate to have with us distinguished scholars to uh, discuss uh, our uh, Indian diaspora um, event. Um, before we get started, I'd like to mention, uh, if you could please uh, turn off your cell phones, because I myself have on occasion forgotten to do so, so just so we don't disrupt the proceedings. And also, we'll be saving questions until the end. So once the speakers have done, I'll be able to moderate any questions or comments that you have. So I'd like to introduce our, our three speakers. Today we have with us um, from India, Dr. Nilofar Barucha and Dr. Sridhar Rajaswaran. Dr. Barucha is a professor in the Department of English at Mumbai University. She's a coordinator at Mumbai University of the Academic Exchange Programs with German Universities, the Indo-Canadian Center, and a member of the Group for Research on the Indian Diaspora, GRID, AUPE project. Professor Barucha is also the co-founder, trustee of the Center for Advanced Studies in India, and is its co-honorary director. She's edited four books in the area of post-colonial literature. Uh, she has also written several short stories. 60 of her articles and reviews have appeared throughout academic journals. Dr. Rajaswaran is professor and head of the Department of English at the University of Kutch in Uj, Gujarat. He is currently DAAD Visiting Professor in Postcolonial English Studies at the University of Munster in Germany. Professor Rajaswaran is one of the two founder trustees of the Center of Advanced Studies in India and is also a co-honorary director. His doctoral work is in the area of WB Yeats and his research has specialized in that area in Ireland and postcolonial theories, race, class, caste, gender studies, and modern India drama in English. Dr. Barucha and Dr. Rajaswaran are also members of our global virtual faculty here at FDU. Dr. Kyati Joshi is Associate Professor of English here at Fairleigh Dickinson uh, uh, I'm sorry, of Education. <laughs> you just changed My apologies. My apologies. Of Education here at Fairleigh Dickinson University. Uh, Dr. Josie is the author of the book, New Roots in America's Sacred Ground, Religion, Race, and Ethnicity in Indian America, which received the National Association for Multicultural Education's 2007 Philip C. Chin Book Award. She's co-editor of Understanding Religious Oppression and Christian Privilege and Improbable Southerners, Asian Americans in the South. Uh, in addition to her scholarly work, Dr. Joshi is a member of the United Nations Committee on the Freedom of Religion. So we are very honored to have with us our three distinguished speakers, and I will turn it over to Dr. Joshi to start our program. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. Is this okay? Um, thank you so much for coming, and I'd really like to say a huge welcome to Dr. Parucha and Dr. Rajaswaran for being here. It's, they've been involved with the GVF program for many years, and um, we're really fortunate to have them on campus today. Um, I'm going to talk a little generally about diaspora just a little bit, and then move into talking about the Indian diaspora in the United States, which has been one of my main research areas. Uh, so over here you have a graphic just that lets you know. Um, uh, I must say a big thanks to Mahesh Nair at the Office of Global Learning for pulling together this image and, um, and sharing it so I can share it with you here today. Um, it gives you a nice visual of um, the Indian diaspora around the world. Okay. So now first, diaspora, all right? Historically, diaspora really referred to a group who was forced from one location, from their homeland. They were exiled. Historically, in scholarship and all, it has referred to, it started out referring to predominantly the Jewish population, 
Greeks then, um, Armenian population. Um, in the last 30 years, diaspora studies has taken on a field of its own. And really today now, um, it doesn't refer it doesn't stick to that once classic definition. Really today, we're, it's a, it encompasses a much wider, it is a, has a much wider definition. And the category really reflects um, politically motivated uprooting and moving of people. And in most cases, this is voluntary migration. People have chosen willingly to leave their homeland and go elsewhere, most often for economic interests but not always, okay? Um, a related term to diaspora is transnationalism, all right? And sometimes people use diaspora and transnationalism interchangeably, and they really are two separate yet related concepts. Transnationalism really involves networks and communities. All right? Um, it's about the flow of information. It's about the flow of people. People in diasporas have transnational lives where they live in one place and not only are connected to a homeland, but also to other diasporic communities. Ooh. Sorry, that wasn't supposed to happen. Okay. The Indian diaspora in the United States. Uh, anybody want to take a guess when we really think about the Indian diaspora starting in the U.S.? When did Indians start arriving in the United States? I'm sorry? A little earlier. Earlier. They came more so after that, but actually... Um, Indians, okay, and back then, remember, it encompassed present-day Bangladesh and Pakistan, started arriving in the late 1700s, okay? Um, we're going to skip that right now. Sorry. Let me, there we go. Late 17 to early 1900s encompasses one time period, all right? We start getting a trickle of migration from India, um, late 1700s, more so after 1857 because of what was going on in India, and then even more into the late 1800s because of the economic needs of the United States. This is when we get predominantly the Punjabi workers coming over to work the vineyards and the orchards and the strawberry fields and on the western part of the United States. Um, and then, the way I think about it, is the next time bracket is 1910 to 1924. And this is not so much about when Indians were coming to the United States in terms of community formation, but it is about what happened in the United States during that time. And 1910 marks one of the first um, cases in United States law where people are fighting for the right to be classified as white for citizenship. Okay, if you know your United States history, although you probably didn't learn it in high school, is that we had the Naturalization Act of 1790, which said you had to be a free white man to be a citizen of this country. So everyone who came over wanted to be white so they could have citizenship. Because if you have citizenship, you have access. You can own land. You can do many things. You can provide for your family. So the goal was to become white. And so in 1910 marks one of the first cases. And indeed, a couple of Indians actually in Georgia, I say that because I'm from Atlanta, so I'm proud of this. Um, a couple of uh, cases that started out in Georgia where um, two Indian men won the right to become citizens. So what happened was there were folks on the West Coast these were store owners in Georgia. There were folks on the West Coast that slowly heard, hey, this is happening on the East Coast. So people um, filed for citizenship. People tried to gain citizenship. And then we get to a very important case, U.S. versus Bhagat Singh Thind. Anybody, anybody heard of this? Anybody heard of this? This is a monumental case in United States history. It is one of two racial prerequisite cases that went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And what I mean by racial prerequisite cases is people of color fighting 
for citizenship trying to explain to the courts that they are indeed white, okay? Gentleman looks like this, okay? And he basically, what you have to know, there's two cases that go hand in hand. The one before this, a Japanese American uh, raising his family in the United States and everything, filed for citizenship. The court said, you're not white, according to biology, so you can't be a citizen. And the predominant thinking of the time was that race is biological, and that, um, and scientific racism, you know, the precursor to Nazism, you know, measuring head size and muscle ligaments and all these kind of things, and that's how people were trying to prove that whites are better and people of color are inferior. So they said to Ozawa, a Japanese man, you're not white by biology, so you can't become a citizen. So Thin decided to use another argument, and actually he won. He basically said he was Aryan. He's, as a Sikh, he basically said he was Hindu, and he won citizenship. But then, and this is where it gets really interesting, and I urge you all to look into this, okay? Because this, this is a, in law schools over the last five, ten years, they dissect these two cases um, in great detail because it says a lot about law in this country. So he wins, and the precursor to INS, People are familiar with INS, Immigration Naturalization Services. Today they're known as United States Customs and Information Services, I think. The precursor to the INS, the head said, wait a minute, this man is never going to fit into this country. I'm paraphrasing, but you can find his words on Google. And so he filed an appeal. He's like, we can win this time. So filed appeal, went all the way to the high court, and the Supreme Court indeed ruled that he might be white, because remember they made the case he was Aryan, and Aryan equals white. He might be white, but he is not Caucasian, as the common man understands him to be. So they just said, no, well, he's not really white, and most people won't think he's white, and therefore we're not giving you citizenship. Okay. If you think this is crazy, it is. Go look it up. Go look it up, okay? But I spend time on this because this says a lot about race in our country here. And particularly, immigrant populations don't always understand the impact of race. And our laws are not neutral. The justices indeed were not neutral at the time. They are guided by the feelings of society and what is in the air. And that's exactly what happened here. All right, then we get to 1946 Loose Cellar Act. Basically, between 1924 and 1965, our doors to immigration were shut, no matter what Lady Liberty was saying over there in New York Harbor. Okay, with a few minor exceptions, this being one of them, immigrants were not getting into the United States. So, in 1946, though, Loose Cellar Act allowed, actually, specifically Indian students to start coming in, all right, and, and some businesses, too. But this is where we start getting first, um, some of the first migrants in. The huge one is the Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965, um, not just for the Indian community and the Indian diaspora, but for many groups in this country, okay? And this is the first time after 1924 that we really opened our doors. And if there's more time, I'll be happy to say more. The next piece of legislation that affects us is 1986 IRCA, which is also known as family reunification. All right, uh, it's when President Reagan was in office and IRCA stands for Immigration Reform Control Act. And basically, this is right now, and everything, when you hear about, oh, they gave amnesty in the 1980s, this is it. Now, the big thing about this with the Indian community is in 1965, it was a certain kind of Indian who was allowed into the country. Okay? It wasn't just anybody. It was a certain kind of Indian. You basically, we have immigration preferences in our, in our law, in immigration law. And... It's based on the needs of our nation state. It's based on the needs of the United States. So we needed 
doctors. We needed medical personnel. We needed professors and engineers. Does anybody know why? Come on, take a guess. You got nothing to lose. You have no grade here. Well, it was really an amalgamation of forces coming together, okay? President Lyndon signed this into law. President Kennedy got the ball rolling. And it was really, we had just finished Korea. We were going into Vietnam. We had a shortage of medical personnel. Russia had just launched Sputnik. And President Kennedy had charged the nation with the space race. And at the time, many of the engineers in India and in China were helping the former Soviet Union. So Kennedy said, I want them. Okay? And this is why you have so many doctors, professors, engineers, nurses in this country from the Immigration Naturalization Act of 1965. All that came to an end in the late 70s, because then our needs changed and we needed something else. But you got a whole bunch of incredibly overachieving people, okay, in, the, in, in India and other countries. This is known as the brain drain, because the best and the brightest left. And this was not just the case in India, but other places. 1986, all those doctors and engineers who came, now were calling over their family members. And really, first preference was given to family reunification. So, it wasn't based on educational qualifications and the intellectual capital that you brought. It was that you had somebody who lived in the United States related to you who could bring you over. So we started getting more diversity in terms of socioeconomic class. And that's a huge thing. And it's important to keep in mind that not every Indian is a doctor or an engineer or a hotel owner. Okay. And then this goes on and on. But this gives you a little bit of frame and a little bit of especially institutional mile markers in terms of community formation in the Indian diaspora in the United States. Um, we're specifically here, we're talking about the immigrant generation and second generation Indian Americans. Okay? Often this gets confusing, so it's really important to keep it straight. Immigrants are first generation Americans. The children of immigrants are second generation. Sometimes people say immigrant and then first generation. But it, the children of immigrants are second generation. All right. And really the other piece that comes into... The other piece that comes into when we're talking about diaspora and transnationalism and all is the issues of identity, hybridity, and authenticity. Immigrants and second generation Indian Americans, their lives are hybrids. They are combined in many different ways of India and the United States. And often, when you look at someone, you just see them as Indian, and you might have a second generation Indian American who's never been to India. Right? So we have to keep in mind of everything that goes along with that. The more colloquial way to think about these concepts is the question, what are you? And you do get that little look like that, like, well, what are you? And how do you identify? They don't usually say, how do you identify? It's, what are you? Okay? And the issue of authenticity is a real one in diasporic communities around the world. Because the sense is, we are not in the homeland. We are not in India. And so you'll find many immigrants and many second generation trying to do certain cultural customs and maintain cultural heritage and be very proud of the fact and say to you, I should say, they say it in a very proud way that, well, we do it just like in India. And the question is, well, why does one have to? But authenticity is a really, really big topic in terms of identity issues. And students struggle with it. I'm a professor in the School of Education. We see it all the time. My own data, my own research, so many people's research. You have second generation Americans who are constantly struggle with this issue of authenticity. Do you speak the language? Do you eat the food? Do you do the rituals? Do you do the religious practices? Do you know what I'm talking about when I say X, Y, and Z? Every cultural group has this. The issue of authenticity is very, very strong. We have it even in terms of the United States, in terms of being an authentic American. What is that? 
I think at the end of the day, on a very practical level, there's scholarly level, and then for me there's practical level. And the practical level is being able to have the discussions and helping people understand that this is what's going on. All right. So I'm going to end there, and I will pass it over to Nilifer. Thank you, Kathy. Is that all right? First of all, a big thank you to Diana and the FTU to Jason for having us over and for the warm welcome and the kind words you've said about us and to Kyati as well. Well, I begin my presentation with this quotation from Salman Rushdie's essay. No, there is no. Uh, uh, yeah. So I begin my presentation with a quotation from Salman Rushdie's essay, Step Across This Line. And the quotation is, to cross a frontier is to be transformed. The modern Indian diaspora, as we know, began during the colonial period when the British Empire had spread its tentacles across the globe and the red stain of imperialism. When you look at the colonial maps, you see the British Empire really blocked in, in red. So the red stain of imperialism had leaked into several diverse land masses. Indian laborers and then entrepreneurs, as we know, followed the Union Jack from the Caribbean islands to Fiji and from Canada to South Africa. Thus were established little Indias, now inhabited by what Kyati was trying to explain to us, second and third generation persons of Indian origins, who the Indian government today calls Pravasi Bharatis. Among this group are also diasporics of more recent post-colonial origins. Swelling these ranks are the global Indians, who are also referred to as transnationals by scholars of the diaspora, and as NRIs, non-resident Indians, by Indians who live entirely or mainly in India, like Sridhar and me. The Indian diaspora is now estimated to be more than 25 million, spread over 100 countries, larger than the entire population of some nation states. As India is a multicultural, multilingual, multiracial, multireligious country, the Indian diaspora too displays all these traits. The Indian diaspora speaks different languages, it speaks Hindi, Punjabi, Gujarati, Marathi, Tamil, etc. And it worships at different altars, Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, Christian, Jewish, and Zoroastrian. India celebrated its first Pravasi Bharati Divas on 9th January. Pravasi Bharati Divas, Divas means day. Pravasi Bharati Divas on 9th January 2003. And as we know, this date has got iconic significance as far as India's current interest in the diaspora is concerned. It is the day on which 9 January 1915, the day on which India's most famous, most celebrated diasporic returned to India. We are talking about Mahatma Gandhi. So India celebrated its first Pravasi Divas on 9th January 2003, a celebration that has now become an annual feature. It is instructive to note here that it's not mere nostalgia that has inspired the mandarins in Delhi to celebrate the Indian diaspora. As Lord Meghna Desai of Britain has said, it's hard-headed business sense, which has probably driven the Indian government machinery finally in the direction of granting dual citizenship to the Pravasi Bharatis, meaning the Indian diasporics. This diasporic population has political and socio-economic importance, not only in their new lands, but also in India, due to the direct and indirect economic investment they make there. The diasporic Indians have also been performing another important role. They have been imaging India to the world. Being away from their land, of, from the land of their ancestors, they have experienced a sense of loss, a sense of self. And by writing, making films 
on their own experiences, they try to regain this lost self. However, this exercise often comes into conflict with the more rooted Indians, the ones who live in India, either all the time or mainly in India, and how they perceive India. This is a definite point of concern, a definite point of tension between the diasporic Indians and the stay-at-home Indians. The colonial Indian diaspora, as we know, also had its predecessors. I mean, the Indian diaspora didn't begin with European colonization. In the pre-colonial Indian diasporas, we have the maritime diaspora, we also have the caravan diaspora. And what do we mean by the maritime diaspora? This is the diaspora that originated from the eastern and western coasts of India and spread out to countries across the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal. This was a trading diaspora, which also carried with it Indian culture and religion, such as Hinduism and Buddhism. And it dates back at least 2,000 years, if not earlier. So this is where we find the great Hindu temples in Thailand and in Cambodia, all due to the maritime diaspora. The caravan routes, which went from northwest of India to Central Asia and from there to Europe, resulted in the caravan diaspora, or what we in Hindi call the karva, so the caravan diaspora. And these were very active trade routes from the 13th to the 16th centuries AD. And like the maritime diaspora, the uh, caravan diaspora also spread Indian culture, religions, languages, and peoples across its trajectories. Additionally, in the prehistoric and early historic eras, you also have not really diasporas, but mass migrations. And these were mass migrations of populations, such as the movement of the early man from Africa into Europe and then into Asia. <coughs> and then the Aryans that you mentioned, the Aryans moving from Central Asia into what is the Indian subcontinent. It's very interesting what Khyati was saying about the case of Thind. Uh, this is interesting because when I was a student, uh, in, I'm a Parsi Zoroastrian, so there is this uh, well, uh, uh, scholars say that it's from Central Asia that the Aryans, one group moved into India and the group that stayed behind in Central Asia, what is today, present day Iran, modern day Iran, they are the Zoroastrians and the, the people who moved into India adopted more and more the Hindu religion became today's present day Hindus. And there is a great deal of similarity between Zoroastrian and uh, Hindu uh, scriptures. If you look at it, even the incantations of the prayers, etc., there's amazing similarity. But getting back to your case, when I was a student in England, and this was at Manchester University in the early 80s, I had to register myself with the local physician, the local doctor. and he wanted my race. He wanted to write down, what is your race? And uh, I said, no, I, I, don't, I don't believe in something called race. I don't want you to write anything at all. So he says, oh, OK, I have to write something. So he writes there Caucasian. Now, this is interesting because I said to him that if you want to write something, you could write Aryan, if that is what you want to write. So he says, no, no, because the uh, Aryans were the original Caucasians because that's where the Caucasian mountains are located. So this is very interesting what you said. Maybe if we could reopen Mr. Thin's case and <laughs> I gave the 30 second version. Okay. I'm happy to tell you more. Very All right. Okay. Very so this was very interesting the way I was put down as Caucasian. And uh, earlier when I had visited the United States, this time the visa form didn't include a column called race. Earlier it used to, and there was also another column earlier which used to say color. It doesn't anymore. And in those days I used to put down blue or green or something like that for color. And I sort of waited eagerly for the immigration officer to, the visa officer to challenge me and he or she never did. <laughs> 
he or she never did. So, I mean, going back to what I have to say about the diaspora. Now, from post-colonial India, too, in the 1950s and 60s, there has been a move to the West in search of jobs as well as higher education. And post-colonial India has also seen a petrodollar diaspora, which people tend to neglect. And there are a huge number of Indians, mainly from the Indian state of Kerala, who went to the Gulf countries to man their oil rigs and to woman their health services. And we, we have this huge number of Indians in different sections of the globe. Now, so, uh, Khyati has already said this to you, but I'd like to go a little further into this. The term diaspora has in the global era undergone a change and no longer refers to people who have been forcibly dispersed, like the Jews through a catastrophic violence or are in forced exile, or even people who have been displaced by colonialism. It today accommodates different political agendas. So the diaspora has political agendas, and it includes immigrants, guest workers are called diasporics, and even there are cyber coolies. I mean, this is again a term, the green card people in Silicon Valley, they are the cyber coolies. They are the jet-setting entrepreneurs who work from their laptops. They are the jet-setting entrepreneurs who can live in any part of the world. And these are all denizens of a transnational, globalized world. And in such a globalized context, the notion of diasporic uh, identity becomes a pluralistic construct, and this is what we have entitled this evening's discussion. And it has to be negotiated, this pluralistic construct has to be negotiated in the changing context of multiple locations in which these new diasporics live. These transnational globalized Indians are to be found not just in the new diasporic locations such as the USA, but also mingle evenly and sometimes unevenly with the older diasporics in the earlier diasporic locations of the UK and Canada. So you have the new transnationals and the older diasporics in different diasporic locations. However, while the terminology has changed in the last two decades, the fact remains that the globalized Indians still share several characteristics of the older colonial and post-colonial diasporas. While their mobility, the mobility of the globalized Indians or the transnationals, is greater than that enjoyed by the earlier diasporics, and their connection with the homeland is immediate and omnipresent through the internet, constant trips back and forth, cinema, television, the print media, they also still grapple with a question of identity. And in some ways, the identities of globalized Indians and transnational Indians is a little more difficult than that of the erst their erstwhile uh, uh, peers. As Homi Baba, the post-colonial critic, puts it, diasporic sometimes live in a third space, neither the old one nor the new one but another one they create for themselves. However, the globalized diasporics of the transnationals live not just across two countries and cultures, the old country and the new country, but are sometimes in a double or even a triple diaspora. They, they really live across national borders. And they, have, and they continue to relate to these multiple homelands, to their multiple locations. If you take the case of the East African diasporics who are settled in London, from there they move to Canada, from there they move to the USA, they, they have multiple locations and they have to grapple with multiple identities. I will just read a little more and then hand over to Sridhar because we might be running out of time. So, because of these multiple locations and the fact that they connect with the original homeland of India is so immediate, in these new transnational globalized diasporas, we have a revival of the local. 
So there is not just the global, but we are talking about the local. So this diaspora has characteristics which we, in diasporic studies today, call the global, a combination of the local and the global. And compounding the problems of having to negotiate identities in multiple locations is the feeling in the old homeland in India that their imaging, the imaging of the diasporics of India, is often not the one that contemporary India might want projected to the world. But having said that, the global Indian is visible, the transnational Indian is visible, occupies power centers today, not just the margins as the earlier labor diaspora used to occupy, and their opinions influence old, their old, as well as new worlds. And the number of such diasporics, the new diasporics, uh, in several, uh, to be found in several locations, such as the USA, and they have today reached what I term a critical mass, as in a nuclear fission. They have reached a critical mass and are upwardly mobile. This changes the earlier profile of the Indian diaspora from a labor diaspora to a bourgeoisie diaspora or a professional diaspora. And then there are these to and fro movements in this diaspora, back and forth, old to new, from one new position to another new location. And to this, I might want to add this and then stop, that one needs to add that the global transnational Indians have also infiltrated positions of power in the world of politics, in their new lands, and hold elected positions as much by virtue of their economic resources as by their intellectual acumen. For example, you have governors of Indian origins in the USA. You have premiers of provinces such as British Columbia who are of Indian origins in Canada. So this gives a completely new kind of uh, context to the diaspora, which we also need to look at. The new ways of looking at diaspora, multiple locations, negotiating new identities, not just a third space, but multiple locations. Thank you. At the outset, is it okay? At the outset, I thank FTU and Diana for having me here, and the nice words Kayati and Diana had to tell about both Nilifar and myself. And it's very difficult to be the third speaker because many of the things which you want to say have already been said. So I assume that this would happen. And I'm speaking in points which in a manner of speaking is a summation of certain things. In other words, they are not newer ideas. I would prefer to stand on the head and shoulders of the speakers before me. Asado ma sadgamaya, tamaso ma jodir gamaya, mrityon ma amrdam gamaya, om shanti, shanti, shanti hi. Lead me from ignorance to knowledge, lead me from darkness to light, lead me from death to immortality, and then to a peace that surpasseth all understanding. An invocation to the innocence that transforms itself through process motion to a self in quest of knowledge, a knowledge that dispels darkness to bask in the light of enlightenment, that at once instills the awareness of an absolute surrender to the eternal, a oneness that rests in a peace that surpasses all understanding. This invocation is part of my upbringing, what one chanted with humility in the formative years the invocation that located knowledge as that which was fundamental to the shaping of a later developing self, which stayed with one 
always entrenched deeply at least in some hidden corner, surfacing at untold moments, being part of a self from which it can never be spliced out, whatever may be the newer constitutive conditions or locations that go to determine the changing subject position. It travels with me, for instance, everywhere, across the oceans, across immigration offices, across borders, across frontiers. Whatever be the new ideological position of that rational mind, however, or whatever the quantum of resocination that has gone into the self that is trying to constantly and continually invent and reinvent itself, in plain speak, it is just there. If this is the cultural backpack I carry, there are others who might carry with them specifically certain other ancient knowledge determined by scriptures religious, talking of a god with a different name, a different nomenclature, but that too is always there. What eighth would inimitably remark with a monkey on a chain and an old foul tune, and the person in Wordsworthian vein, the child is the father of the man. Indentured labor diaspora did carry with it, uneducated as it were in the knowledge of the literate, it had a concrete manifestation, a pocket edition of the Ramayana. Later diaspora have a new location for it, first space, second space, third space, but it is still there, sometimes in an altar, at times in a wallet, or at times where one may not easily see it, but it is still there. Hence, I deemed it reasonable to begin my little note thus. Coming to the point, the use of the word diaspora is strictly not in the sense of its older definitions. The use of the word definition is by virtue of the certain parameters that have been evolved thanks to serious scholarship and sustained studies in this area, a scholarship which is redefining itself and hence this talk too this evening scholarship that operates within the definitives of a time and space logic that's a shifting spatio-temporal reality. In our context, in the context of today's specific entitling, the word may thus denote a new order of connotations and vice versa. The topic with the stress on the era of globalizations in itself, one may state with equanimity does away with the sense of the strangulating loss for a homeland, though this is not to state that, it, that there is a complete abdication of the sense of homelessness or an equal comfort level established in the new place. The point is, old homes are yet close or accessible and increasingly even such accessibility is empowering and in instances even more endearing and undoubtedly there is no impediment to return but for certain minor groups or groupings. Other reasons missed out could be more pecuniary in nature. Coupled with all these, there is also the reasons of forging of certain new ties in the new land. If the former, a promise of the ability to return to a homeland, the latter, the promise of a home in the new land. This may be quintessential new change in the tagging of the world diaspora. What I would then like to advance as a point of view, though, is that there no more exists the old state of limbo when the diasporics were caught between two worlds, one dead and the other powerless to be born, or to appropriate Auden, the diasporic was no more walking across a tightrope as if there was no death or hope of falling down. New sojourns are symbolized principally by a sense of achieved agency which was conspicuously absent in the earlier labor diasporas, which were either hegemonizing theft or involuntary suicide. Such achieved agency as it were in the newer diasporas gives space for the individual to be in a group, to be outside of it, to be part of it, to be its own or otherwise, be mainline or stay in the fringes, be in a system provided space or be even that game changer. With such interaction and negotiation available, the earlier vulnerability of private space is ably made transcendent through pluralizations and polarizations. I privilege the public space as change in this domain needs more of work in simple terms due to the very nature of civitas and universitas. There then is a multicultural, 
and transcultural space that begins where all ladders earlier, to quote AIDS again, had stopped. The boundary then is not where one ends a discovery or a journey, but where one actually begins, this deflecting barber. A few examples. One is a film called Bend It Like Beckham. Anupar Kerr in Bend It Like Beckham, along with his wife, constitutes the first space, while the second space problems are vested with the elder of the two daughters. These being inconsequential to progression, what is interesting is the protagonist, Jas Jaswinder, who bends it like Beckham into the third space, which exists in actuality on both sides of the goalpost, in between when she kicks the ball, which is hurled through the air by a decisive foot. She seemingly did not have an agency, and by procuring one, there is a victory for gender, which interestingly writes back for the people back home a victory from the vantage position of an outsider-insider. Traditional role plays and stereotypes being questioned, a kind of look which in Edward Said's words, if one were to affect a chronotopic reading, become more palpable. My second example is a film called Namesake. The passive observer in a patriarchal intellectual home, decisively becoming an active participant, is the story, anyway, in namesake. Agency aptly referred to even in the title, acquired by the actress Taboo, who plays the role of the wife, confusion which might lead to knowledge, which is the story of Gogol, the son, confusion worse confounded in his new relationship with what he believes might be the clone of his mother of Esther years when he chooses an immigrant Indian bride for himself, or the immigrant Indian bride as it to arrive from a crossroads. Copious are the references in text and imagistic representations, be it a monsoon wedding, Easter cyst, Leela, namesake, whatever, they all point in one direction. Whatever be the representation, the world now is a pluralized, polarized, globalized a world, a newer order that needs newer terms of reference and death this evening. Thank you very much. I'd like to open up uh, for questions. If anyone has questions or comments they'd like to pose to the speakers. Well, I'll start the ball rolling. Um, all nations or ethnic groups um, have diaspora throughout the world. Um, and some are more connected to their homelands, others less so. And I wonder with uh, the Indian diaspora, what role religion might play in connecting them to the homeland? Is What significance does that uh, serve in its connection? To so anyone who'd like to. Well, um, religion plays a very large role. Uh, my, my own research focused on looking at actually the role of religion in the lives of second generation, Indian American, Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, and Christians, and atheists. I had a few atheists in my study. And what's really fascinating um, and, uh, is that the atheists felt that religion was so important. They didn't identify with Hinduism religiously, but culturally they did and feel very strongly about how that ties them to India. The other thing we see, and this is common across groups, is that religion becomes more important as you get older. So a lot of the folks in my study talked about how when they were young, um, being forced to go to pujas, the Hindus were forced to go to pujas, um, and the Christians were forced to go to church. Everybody was forced to go to their house of worship. Nobody wanted to go. However, as they got older, and in their words, when you listen to these interviews, whenever they spoke about India, it was about having a religious connection. And so predominantly this happened with the Hindus. The Muslims didn't speak of it this way. Um, the Christians, some of the Christians did. And then the atheist, again, the spin was it was more cultural. They kept saying, well, I'm not religious. They, you know, 
as if I was going to forget it when they said it for the 800th time. But they kept making sure I got that. So it's really interesting to see that, I mean, religion has a multifaceted role beyond just spirituality. And it's really a way that transnational lives are lived for both the immigrant and second generation. I could add to this, when we speak of identity and we talk of ethnic identity, usually sociologists speak in terms of ethno-religious identities because ethnicity and religions go together. Because when you speak of identity, there is the ethnicity, there is religion, there is language, and then there's the issue of the homeland. And several diasporic groups have one or more or all of these aspects to their identities. And apart from finding religion important as you grow older, with or without its spiritual context, there, there is also the, the fact that away from the homeland, the religion becomes an important ethnic marker, the, re, the ethno-religious marker. It becomes very important. And as Sridhar has said, the earlier diasporics who were mainly illiterate still carried in a little piece of red cloth a Ramayan with them, which became the iconic binding text, which held them together in places as far away as Fiji or Mauritius or the West Indies, from where there was no return. They had crossed the Kalapani. There was no return, unlike the transnationals and the global. So very, very important ethnic marker. Like Thank me. you. Yes, would you like to add to that, please? No, you had asked the question in the context of India and religion, right? So I think specifically when you start looking at a place like India, it has been subject to multiple influences. I wouldn't use the word colonization. Okay. So when we talk Aryan, Ar the original, Aryan is a good word in India, okay. Um, it's not a bad word, uh, like in Germany. Uh, what happened was, like, they came down with a primitive form of religion. The very first lines, which are in scriptures, if you keep talking about it, comes from the Rig Veda, and it goes like this, Agni milelehe prohitam egnasya deva mritam. What happens actually is we talk about worshipping Agni. So the elements are the things which are worshipped. And this got intellectualized only in the 8th or the 9th century AD. So till that time, this thing which we call Hinduism would be more a way of life. So it is not a religion in that sense of the term. Second thing, when we come down to Mahavira and then to Buddha, Buddha just turned around and threw all the scriptures away. The Buddha I am talking about. He turned around and talked about the doctrine of Sunyata, which is nothing but atheistic. The third very interesting point is when you come down to uh, Vedanta or Advaitic studies or Vishishta Advaitic studies or anything to that effect, we have an intellectualized position completely. So at every point in time, this notion of idolatry or anything was conspicuous by its absence. It was more an intellectualized religion. So by virtue of this, you know, the status of religion is not like doctrinaire Christianity or doctrinaire Islam or anything to that effect as far as Hindus are concerned. And second, when we talk Christianity, I stand corrected, it is as old as Christianity itself, because one of the apostles of Christ had come down to India. So it is 2,000 years old. So all religions which are there in the context of India are quite old. And with the passage of time, we have had multiple colonizations, meaning different rulers at this point, who have always tried to fuse and make the place a better place. So it was a place of absolute religious tolerance. So this kind of religious tolerance has its own different un principle of secularism. So it does not affect the Indian diasporic at one level. At the same level, he can carry it wherever he goes, the cultural background he belongs to. Only recently, in 1985, when you look at the base and the superstructure referendum, religion for the first time got aligned to politics. Till that time, religion was always allied to culture. 
with economy being the base. Even the Hindu trinity stands for it. Brahma, the creator, and his feminine consort is uh, Saraswati, who stands for knowledge. Shiva is the destroyer, and the feminine construct for that uh, destruction happens to be Shakti. Then uh, Vishnu is the preserver, and the feminine con construct would become desire. So in Foucauldian terms, it is nothing but knowledge in the intersection of power and desire. That is what we have been carrying, so there has been no problem. Thank you very much. That was really insightful. Yes. It was, it was really good listening to you because um, to Baba's idea of third space added to it, and that made a lot of sense. Um, I, I was thinking of, of two things. One is uh, this conflict that you spoke of between the Indians and India, who for so long have it ignored the diaspora as a kind of weakened, uh, a diluted version of themselves, uh, but now are paying attention for economic reasons. But if you could speak a little bit more about what this conflict of representation is, because you would see it in the earlier Bollywood films where the westernized or the NRIs were represented in a very specific, stereotypical way. And now the, the hero and the heroines themselves are <coughs> from these diasporas. Um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm, because of my own personal experience, I'm curious as, as to what the other side thinks. Um, and then also I think in, in our uh, communities, at least here, those people who came in the 70s or 80s and who have grown older, whose children have grown older, they're also in a peculiar situation. They don't, they have access to these technologies, uh, but not necessarily um, the kind of social connection left anymore that their, their children have uh, because their children are growing up in a much more assimilated mm -hmm. environment or the younger um, uh, immigrants mm -hmm. who, who have access in, in a different way to, um, uh, to culture here and to culture there. Um, so I was wondering what space you envision mm -hmm. for, for, for that community yeah. who's lived out their youth and middle age here but are now kind of terrified of growing old in this country. Uh, I don't really think I'm qualified to uh, answer the latter part of your question because I'm not a diasporic here in the USA. Maybe Khyati can take it up. But what you said earlier about why the conflict and what is this conflict, and you rightly said that the earlier Bollywood films are very, very stereotypical in their uh, 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 constructs of East and West, and a wonderful example is Manoj Kumar with his Purab or Paschim. I mean, the Paschim is all, the West is all evil and degraded and degenerate, and there you have the, the diasporic uh, Indian girl who's grown up in London with a golden wig and blue contact lenses and with a cigarette in her hand and a glass of wine in the other hand and she she just typifies everything that the Indian mind then thought of as the degenerate West. So at one level it is this kind of a pride in your own values, whether they are family values, spiritual values or whatever social values. And the notion that once you go to the West, you kind of become a betrayer. You, you leave behind your own country. And uh, uh, Salman Rushdie puts this very well in a second novel, Shame, which is about Pakistan, like Midnight's Children is about India. And there he says that the people in Pakistan might say to me, out, trespasser. Uh, and you are you are an intruder. How dare you talk about us? So that kind of a notion, you have left us, gone away. You find it in so many Hindi film songs as well. The sense of betrayal on the part of the diasporic. He went in search of money. He 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 left behind his village. He's forgotten his mother. He's forgotten his father. And what right has he now to talk about us? But now in the 90s with a new global uh, India, with 
with a new liberalized global economy. And then there's just the opening up, and I think the internet and satellite television, the average Indian is open to so many, so many influences which she wasn't open to earlier. And, and now slowly the idea that, hey, we guys aren't the only ones who, who think of family. Others have family values as well. Others cherish their own religion. Others, other people are moral as well. It's not just us. And as you said, these crossover films, like Kabi Kushi, Kabi Gum, which incidentally is a huge hit in Germany with mainstream Germans. And Sridhar and I have been teaching there on a regular basis. And it's, it's part of their Christmas fair. You know, like films are repeated every year. And it's been dubbed in German. It's a huge industry there. I mean, Indians dubbing Hindi films into German, or even Tamil films now are dubbed into German, because they are also looking for these so-called uh, family values and this kind of loyalty and whatnot. So the, no, not the, Ger not the Indians and German diaspora. We are talking German Germans. Are we are talking French French? Even the French, they just love Shah Rukh Khan, incidentally. Yes, that's another story. That's another story. <laughs> yeah. um, Shah Rukh Khan, for those who are wondering, is a huge Indian film star. Huge. You know, um, maybe I was going to just say, I was just going to say that. I was just going to say, he's the Tom Cruise of India. Um, your question, I would actually co go back to you with a couple of questions, because I think you're talking about um, folks who might be in their 50s, 60s, 70s, right? And so I think the first thing to say, so there's anecdotal data and there's research studies. And I will tell you in terms of research studies, this is a population that has been identified by many of us who do research on the Indian American or South Asian American community as we need more research here. Um, having said that, the few things to consider is, uh, the, the few things to consider are, um, what is the situation vis-a-vis -vis their family, okay? Because you've got folks in that age range whose children immigrated here in their 20s and 30s on H-1B visas as the tech workers, the um, cyber, cyber coolies, right? Okay, I love that phrase, by the way. You also have those who are in that age range who came in 1965 with a lot of e um, intellectual capital and now might have a great amount of economic capital. And with them, what we're seeing is folks, in some cases, returning to India. And the other factor you have to take into this is globalization and the fact that India has come on the world stage. So now, they might not only want to be in India because that is where their heart is, but it is also where they can invest. So it is where their retirement is also. And then there are those who also go back and forth. Right. So I think it depends on also the kinship. If most of your family with 1986 Erica, if most of your family from your village and your hometown has come here, then there's no reason to go back. So it depends on those situations. If you still have many family members there, you might go back. So these are all the factors that play into. And then the other piece in it that we see is really, um, especially with the parents of, um, who've come here, who basically have uprooted their lives and come and followed their children, who are the tech workers, the cyber coolies. Um, we're really seeing, I think, this is anecdotal, okay? And you can check with, um, I wanna say the organization is NAMI New Jersey. They do mental health work here in New Jersey, but um, I, know, I think people are starting to look at rates of depression because there's the issue of transportation and mobility. They, they don't necessarily have driver's licenses. They have limited English proficiency in some cases, and how are they getting around? What we're also seeing in New Jersey specifically is organizations that cater to the seniors, specifically those who fall into this category. So there are a lot of factors to consider. Thank you. Are there other questions or comments? Okay. Well, I'd like to thank our three speakers. It was absolute splendid presentation. And I'd like to thank everyone for coming this evening through the rain. <laughs> and we look forward to having um, 
this uh, this session recorded and on, available on our website. So if you're interested in viewing it, please let me know and I'll be sure to uh, advise you when it is available. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.